Number 25 is Wreckfest, which considers itself a spiritual successor to Flat Out, and that the developers called a cross between Flat Out and Destruction Derby. Now, if you remember Destruction Derby, it was a vehicular combat racing game and it was great. And Wreckfest is basically that. I mean, it's not exactly the same. It certainly caused some nostalgia towards that type of game though. And it uses a really unique soft body damage modeling system, which is really not something you see very much in racing games, at least yet. I don't know if they all necessitate it. I certainly think it's implemented well in this game and it's a lot of fun. I enjoyed the the hell out of it. Next is Vampire, which is an action RPG narrative. It is such an interesting game. It's not perfect, it has its flaws, but what they went for and accomplished in this game, in my opinion, is just above and beyond what I had really known what it would be. I mean, there's parts of it that are janky, the combat's a little basic, but in all honesty, it's fun, and the story and choices you get to make that interact with the world in a such a different way from a lot of other games, it's more than forgivable. Number 23 is Yakuza 0, which is actually a prequel to the entire Yakuza series and took its sweet ass time getting over to the West. Even sweeter of its ass time did it take was getting to Windows and that's specifically the version we're talking about here on this list. This is frankly a stunning looking game on any platform, but on Windows it looks goo. I mean, it's Yakuza at this point. It's everything it should be. It's deep, it's dense, there's tons of mini games and arcade games, and it's so fun. Number 22 is Celeste. Celeste is a platformer that just really hits every mark you could ask for. It's gorgeous. It manages to take advantage of retro graphics in a way that it's kind of difficult to do now because a lot has been done with it. One of the ways it does this is by changing her hair color instead of having a HUD. And that to me is just such a creative idea. On top of it, the level design in this game is so wonderfully good. It is a hard platformer, but I never felt overwhelmed. And when I say that, I don't mean I didn't die because I died a lot, but it's just a pretty game that I enjoyed a lot. The music is amazing. Atmosphere, amazing. Graphics, amazing. Just an amazing game. Number 21 is Dragon Ball Fighters. At the moment, there isn't a Dragon Ball Z game that looks as cool as this one and plays as cool as this one for that matter. It's a fighting game that really just does so much more than you would expect and it looks like a cartoon. Genuinely looks like a cartoon. It's basically what I imagined fighting games would look like when I was a kid and that's pretty wild. But on top of that, it's actually really fun. A lot of your favorites are here and it's not just that it looks like a cartoon, but it looks like a cartoon that does a bunch of things that aren't usually possible in a cartoon. It's just hard to argue with this game. It's beautiful, it's fun as hell, and it feels like it's been out forever. It feels like something that always has been, which is, in my opinion, something that really is a sign of a great game. Number 20 is Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden. Now this is a game that takes tactical RPGs, stealth systems, and big goofy anthropomorphic animals and combines it into a thing that I just absolutely love. Think 90s, mascot XCOM, not platformer. This is a stylish game, it's got a great graphical style, and all of the humor that is littered throughout is just top notch. On top of that, it's got an engrossing story that I actually cared about. Well done, Mutant Year Zero. Thank you for existing. Number 19 is Ghost of a Tale, a game in which you play as a mouse. A mouse by the name of Tilo. It is an action RPG. And when you look at this game, you think, oh, probably like, maybe not a triple A game, but double A? No, it was produced mainly by a single person. It's one of the best looking games that's ever been made with the Unity engine. And frankly, as an adventure stealth game mostly developed by a single person that frankly looks comparable to most double A level games, this deserves so much more attention than it got. This is a great game. Buy it and support this. I mean, seriously, it's amazing. Number 18 is Into the Breach, a turn-based strategy game that takes a very retro look and yet feels like something you really haven't played before. Now, keeping in mind, it is very much along the lines of a tactical RPG. It just feels feels refreshing because it's such a different take on the genre. It's beautiful, the colors just evoke everything that it intends to, and frankly, it's one of the more smooth and tight entries into this genre I can remember off the top of my head. Number 17 is Hitman 2, which is refining the formula that Hitman kind of found again in the episodic reboot 
When I found out they were working on a sequel, I was really excited because, frankly, the episodic game is just everything Hitman has ever sold itself as and more. It's great, and Hitman 2 totally lives up to it. It expands on all of the concepts, which means it's probably the best Hitman game to date. And it's also probably the funniest Hitman game to date. They did just everything right in this. It's exactly what Hitman, a stealth assassination game that doesn't take itself overly seriously should be. Number 16 is A Way Out, a narrative co-op game, which is not something you hear too often. It had two characters who busted out of prison, survived on the lam, and had to outrun a lot of other, well, unsavory figures, let's say, as well as the big twist. In case you haven't played it, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Instead, I'm going to tell you that you should play it. A Way Out is friggin' phenomenal. Phenomenal. It is just a testament to what a narrative game can be, and I highly recommend it if you are even vaguely interested in the genre. Number 15 is Warhammer Vermintide 2, a first-person action game that continues the co-op battle against the Chaos Army. You know, rat people. It has the distinction of being a great co-op, melee-oriented first-person game, and there's not a lot of that. I think probably because nobody's really come up with a game that worked as good as the first Vermintide, and now this one it reaches even higher levels than the first i mean you're talking 15 classes every single one has their own tree and the action is fast paced interesting and makes a first person game that doesn't have guns or really even a lot of projectiles at all really interesting number 14 is far cry 5 which is one of the better far cry games or at least north of my expectations for it at the same time it does pretty much exemplify a lot of what's wrong with far cry but not in so bad a way that i can't bring myself to say it actually doesn't belong on this list it does. I mean, it's such an interesting and original story that turns a lot of historical events from America in on themselves and takes a gameplay formula that I would normally criticize for being a little too familiar and gives us a world that's just dense, interesting, beautiful, and a story that's just wild. Yes, you're going to do some of the annoying open world stuff, but it's actually worth it in Far Cry 5, especially knowing where the sequel's going. I mean, Ubisoft did something very right here. It's not perfect, of course. It's got its flaws, but I ended up finding myself pretty hooked to it. I liked it a lot. Number 13 is Dead Cells. Oh, Dead Cells, you are so wonderful. In addition to being developed by an anarcho-syndicalist co-op, which is just bizarre, you don't really hear that kind of thing very often. Dead Cells happens to also be a really creative and interesting game. It's a game that feels like a Metroidvania, but really isn't. It's a roguelike. You have a lot of different worlds to traverse, and you set right at the beginning when you die. It's pretty much a version of permadeath, and it's hard. But it's also really, really a good flow that keeps you minimally frustrated, even when you die at a pivotal point. It's certainly not unique in its type, but it's probably the best of this type of game I've played. It pretty much learns all the lessons of the genre, implements so much, and keeps you interested so well. I also love playing it on Switch. It's absolutely wonderful on Switch. Number 12 is Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which continues where Assassin's Creed Origins left off in terms of gameplay enhancement. Frankly, what Origins did to the Assassin's Creed formula was really good, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey expands on it in some ways that do work, others that don't not work. They don't really get in the way, but did they really add anything? But overall, it gives us probably the best, most beautiful, most detailed, most lived in, most dense, most interesting location we've ever played Assassin's Creed in. And again, it also benefits from being a post-Origins game where we have the much more RPG oriented elements added in. It's it's a hell of a game. Like is it as good as Origins? No, but the fact that they came out with another one this high quality just a year after that, it's impressive. I do hope they slow down and we continue at the very high quality, but we'll see. Number 11 is Monster Hunter World, which is absolutely 100% just everything you could ask for from it. Monster Hunter is such a beloved franchise and frankly we've never gotten a bad game, but this is kind of the call culmination of all of the experience. It's accessible to Western audiences, it's a full open world game, 
and yet it retains everything that makes Monster Hunter so good. And let's just go ahead and say this, this is a triple A game that deserves to be called a triple A game. Number 10 is Return of the Obra Dinn, a very, very specific looking game. It's a black and white puzzle game that is very stark, very bold, that puts you in the role of an insurance adjuster who has to find out what happened to an East India trading company ship where the crew and passengers all just died. The game is a logic puzzle that engages the player in deductive reasoning so when you beat this game you feel really good it's one of those games that makes you feel smart without I think doing it cheaply which is nice and really you can't deny the look of this game you're not gonna see a lot of games do something as bold as this let alone just make this beautiful atmospheric mystery that's hard to imagine any other way honestly number nine is Final Fantasy 15 on the PC which is a total great graphical upgrade from the console version. It is genuinely about a generation ahead of the console version of the game. It has 4K support, but that's not all it does. There's revamp textures scenes are occupied by more people just everything about it is noticeably much prettier and it's hard to understate exactly how interesting final fantasy 15 is with the route it takes for character development if you didn't play it the windows edition is the way to do it number eight is valkyria chronicles 4 a return to form for the series and just an absolutely enjoyable version of this game best graphics in the series best battles I've experienced in a while. Just a completely unique type of gameplay. Valkyria Chronicles, whenever they do it, and they do the normal Valkyria Chronicles thing instead of the revolution thing, you should just play it, it's great. At number seven is Battletech, a turn-based strategy game based in the old school, frankly, kind of left by the wayside franchise that hasn't got the kind of attention it deserves in a very long time. This is a game that doesn't just give you a more than competent strategy mech game, but it gives you a great story, actual characters to care about, and Harebrained Schemes, a company founded by one of the people involved in creating the Battletech slash Mech Warrior franchise, and it shows because this game is really lovingly crafted. It was clearly a passion project for folks involved with it, and if you like turn-based strategy this is one you have to try out this year number six is frost punk a game that just it seems so easy to explain but i don't think it says enough it's a city building game that's also a survival game and it's just such a different idea and yet seems so familiar without being boring it's a game that forces you to make hard decisions like intentionally very hard decisions that frankly there isn't an appealing answer to and this sort of dark version of a city building game is just something that I feel like we need more of. I hope the developers continue to make games like this where they build on this type of a concept because it's so fun, it's so good, and it really does actually affect you. It makes you feel like, oh, I didn't really want to do this, but I had to, yay. Number five is Kingdom Come Deliverance, which do not get me wrong, has its problem. This is a game that, well, launched pretty buggy. It's got a lot of arguments about it across the internet, but there is one thing it deserves some praise for, and that is its combat system. It is one of the most ambitious combat systems in a game, period. And it takes a lot of learning and nuance to get a hold on exactly what you're doing, but once you do, it is very satisfying. Number four is Insurgency Sandstorm, a tactical first-person shooter game, which is a game that focuses very, very hard on realism, keeps the HUD very simple it's a game where you have to play on one of two sides in certain or security and it is absolutely brilliant as either competitive or co-op it's very detailed very realistic and as far as sound design goes a bit disturbing frankly but hey it's something that really feels a little bit more real which sometimes that's very good number three is forza horizon 4 out of the two forza series my preference is definitely horizon it's really just a beautiful game that has dynamic seasons shows just a ton of jaw-dropping scenery all around britain and really just ends up putting together a shared world that works in such a seamless and enjoyable fashion it's big that's like the thing that you can describe this game as not just big for the sake of big though but a really well developed deep experience that manages to be both deep and casual i love it i really enjoy it number two is subnautica which is an open world survival game that is set 
basically underwater. It takes place on an alien planet. That alien planet is an ocean planet. And it's your job to explore it. And it's beautiful. And it's sometimes dangerous and horrible. And the base building is actually good. It's not just the same thing as every single game. There's a creative mode. There's a hardcore mode. It's a really interesting game. And I get why a lot of people think it's the best survival game. And at number one, we have Pillars of Eternity 2 Dead Fire. You know, because Obsidian is great. It's a direct sequel to Pillars of Eternity, continues the story and yet gives you such a larger world to explore and deal with. AI is improved, lots of problems of pathfinding were improved, just so much is better in this version of the game. And Pillars of Eternity itself is one of the absolute best examples of the top town old school CRPG. Obsidian is just the king of RPGs. Honestly, they're great. They're just going to put out great RPGs until, you know, the world ends or whatever happens. So good on them. A quick bonus for you, Sea of Thieves for Windows, which, I mean, it's a game that has some fair criticism for it, but it is a highly ambitious very pretty, fun game to hang out in. I do hope it continues to get support. It's a great game, I enjoy it, and I think if expanded upon it could be an ongoing incredible experience. We'll see though, because it had some harsh criticism. Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, which, let's just be clear, if you've ever played a platforming game and thought, hey, this is good, I have to recommend. The first three Crash games were amazing. And considering they were made at a time when the 3D platformer wasn't really established as to exactly what it would be, it's tremendously influential because it managed to merge the sort of course style 2D platforming conventions with multi-directional movement. I love Love Crash. The remakes look amazing and gorgeous and they play better than ever. Just some of my favorite games. And finally, Ashen, which is a Souls-like with a totally different graphic style. Frankly, one of the most visually enticing of the Souls-like games. And it just gives some type of kind of journey-like graphics with a similar story to Dark Souls, but somehow feels more personable and nobody has faces. What were your favorite PC games of 2018? Leave us a comment, let us know what you're thinking, and if you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. The best way to see them first is to click the subscribe button and not to forget to click the notification bell. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero. We'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.